We'll start off like that. So, hi everybody. Um, super happy to be here. Uh, so, Jen, you covered a lot of this already. Um, I spent before Google Cloud. I was at a company, local co another local company called Rebel.com. We sold domain names, and before that, a couple of digital agencies. Really, the key, you know, just being like, I've been in Ottawa for a while. Lots of meetups, and I'm really uh, excited that AI Thinkers is doing so well. There's lots of attendance. And you know that whole post-COVID coming back, it's great to see lots of folks coming together to meet. And I think that um, it's a great way, great way to share. Um, and so Ottawa Civic Tech, yeah, you may have seen me there. Um, I also tend to go to uh, you know, maybe climate tech meetups. Invest Ottawa has a great one um, that they host here. Sorry, Invest Ottawa does. Um, and JavaScript meetups and, and so on. But it's, uh, I'm really happy that the community is coming back together to talk about tech. And I will talk about civic tech as we go and um, tell you a little bit about what's coming up in the fall, but I'll tell you at the end. Um, <clears throat> I also ran this hackathon called Random Hacks of Kindness. And that's kind of where I'm going to kick this off. But it's really that concept first. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why. So as we go on our journey, I'm just going to take a little quick pit stop here. And then we'll keep going. Um, but it's important. And okay, so I have been, I've been in tech for 20 plus years, and a lot of that time I've spent um, exploring the space of how can tech help um, social good or people or citizens. I, I've always I've tended to come and point to that William Gibson quote, "The future's already here; it's not evenly distributed." And you know, that, you know, it has nuances, and you know, you could debate it. But I think it's important, especially for in the, the case of digital access, you know, digital access, uh, equity, and um, access to technology and accessibility and all that, because not everyone has access to all the benefits that come with new technology. Now, sure, we're in here and we're taking advantage of technology for. Uh, you know, to, to build new products, and consumers are using new technology, and they use AI, and new companies are, but until everyone really has access, you know, our quality of life uh, in aggregate isn't really going up. And I think that until we can help social sector and the public sector take advantage of digital transformation and, and AI technology, we're not really going to get that, um, that real lift in, in quality of life that we, we, that we want out of technology, right? That technology has promised us. Uh, part of the reason, and so uh, throughout my career, I've kind of tried to weave these concepts into my work. And part of the reason why I um, took this job, and I should have introduced myself better. Well, I guess Jen mentioned it, but um, I'm at uh, Google Cloud. And uh, I'm on the public sector team, and I help uh, my uh, sort of public sector clients take advantage of Google Cloud. And it's across all Google Cloud. So it's not just AI, but it's, it's all infrastructure. I took the job to have an impact on lives of Canadians through helping government take advantage of technology. That's why I do that. That's why I did sort of took this role, because it's important to me. And, I, and um, in this new wave of technology, in this new type, you know, this new movement we have of AI, because you know, digital transformation has been promising all these new great upgrades to the quality of life for a number of years. But AI, if you don't take if we don't take advantage of it now, then it's really you know we're going to really get caught behind, and the dig, that that digital gap in access and equity is going to widen, and it's going to be harder for people to catch up and take advantage of technology, more so. So. Part of what I'm, I'm here, I'm gonna, um, I have a bit of a thesis. I want to show you a little bit about you know, uh, how we can a little bit easier to take advantage of that technology. So that's kind of the thesis of why I'm here. Why I'm here. And sure, it may sound like a bit of sales pitch, but I promise I'm trying, I'm trying not to. But uh, I want to show that you know, there's, easier, there's easy ways to take advantage of that technology. So that's, that's the, the first thing. The second thing I want to ask of the group is to um, as you continue to build, as you go forward, as you rock forward, we have a lot of education to do, and we have a lot of work to do to reduce that, that access to technology. So I'd encourage you to continue to build uh, equitably, 
uh, build for equity, try to reduce that gap, uh, bring everyone along with you as you go. <clears throat> and, you know, of course, build responsibly too, but just keep that in the forefront um, as you go and move forward. Um, Ottawa Civic Tech, uh, mentioned it a little bit. Ottawa Civic Tech, and, and I'll get through this quickly, but it's a, um, it, it's, it's a place where there's a convergence of uh, builders and, and where uh, uh, government and uh, co come together to solve problems that will um, create more uh, opportunities for, um, for, uh, for everyone, for society. And so Ottawa Civic Tech is getting a reboot, um, and it's a place where you can build tech and apply tech to civic problems. So if you're interested in this space where uh, technology can be used for the greater good, uh, check out Ottawa Civic Tech. Um, you know, like I said, I used to run these hackathons, uh, random hacks of kindness, uh, random hacks of kindness. There aren't a lot of these uh, opportunities to apply your technology to your thinking to you know, kind of social causes. Ottawa Civic Tech is one. Check it out. Um, I can, I'm happy to talk about this afterwards too. Okay, so back to um, the presentation. Uh, and I'm gonna get into demos and really um, uh, more technical things and I'll get off my soapbox too. Um, but what I wanna show is um, easy way to create this, take advantage of this technology, okay? Uh, so yeah, that's a lot of, that was, um, that was quite a bit. Thank you for <laughs> sitting through that. Uh, does this go in here? Do you know? Click in. Yeah. Not gonna work. Okay, cool. Uh, okay, so yeah, just bear with me as I. Uh, so I'm gonna. So what I'm gonna do here is. Um, show a few things, uh, in particular Gemini really quickly because I know you've seen this, you've likely seen Gemini, but you've likely seen maybe sort of parallels to um, uh, ChatGPT. So I, I'll just show you a little bit, but I'm going to show you a little bit about how I use it uh, in, my, in my work um, to help me, uh, you know, sort of maybe reduce some of the toil. But, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about Gen AI Studio, Vertex AI, and how you take advantage of it. Um, in a more automated fashion and, in, and, and on the cloud, Agent Builder a little bit too, um, another tool of ours, okay? So um, so who here, I mean, of course, everyone's using ChatGPT. Uh, who you here uses, does anyone use Gemini? Did they? Okay, awesome. I'm going to um, share. Oh, amazing, hold on, sorry. I should just click my links. Okay, cool. So uh, I imagine, uh, this is not a great example, but this is like a really simple example. Um, I mean, you guys probably use it multimodal. Everyone, are folks using multimodal uh, on their app? And okay, who's using, uh, not Gemini, but just like AI on their phone as kind of an agent, uh, just chatting to it, yeah, okay. So I use it a lot for multimodal. Yeah, it's a little picture of like, these things that are on my couch outside. Okay, are they wrap droppings? Sure, they're wrap droppings, all right. Um, uh, and so I just use it uh, as that sort of that assistant. Um, not super, this isn't the most exciting thing. But, um, you know, uh, identifying house plants, right? And so I imagine we're all sort of using AI for this kind of thing now. And it's, we're finding it super useful and the um, sort of family does as well, for sure too. The other, so as I start to use it for work, it gets a, li it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, is anyone here uh, uh, work in security? Anyone that's a like, uh, cybersecurity analyst? Okay, cool. At least tangentially, it, it's, I found it um, incredibly uh, sort of more useful. So what I'll start off, like what I started off with in this particular thread, um, and I'll start from the, oh, I'll walk you through it. Um, so I started off with the basic, you know, sort of explaining that we're, that uh, I need some help with um, this understanding NIST 853. And this is a security regime that if you're building apps, you would comply with, and in particular, uh, public sector definitely has to, uh, would comply with the security regime. And so it would start off with, 
you know, high level. But then as we get into it, you know, we can start to ask, how does it apply to Canada, right? Sure, and, and fairly easy, this is all public content, and it's easy to make those connections. But then I'll, you know, we'll start to get into something a little bit, um, you know, very sort of specific. And we might say like, you know, how does, how does GCP, uh, or what products, what products, what services on GCP would help comply with SC, uh, SC7? And it, it will, you know, it'll be able to provide that sort of connection of services. And then, and that, so that's fairly useful. But then, you know, um, assuming you know what SC7 is, but it's, you know, it's a quick uh, check to see what, to describe what SC7 does. But then what we can do then um, is to actually, what I found useful then is, well, you could say write Terraform for, uh, let's see, SC7 tends to need Cloud Armor probably, or uh, CDN. Or CDN, like uh, cloud armor, and so you can start to uh, have it actually generate code for you, and then after that, or on this or the flip side of it, we can have it analyze whether or not the code will help sort of comply against it, and so in you know uh, typically sort of security analyst work tends to be a lot of sort of referencing and uh, sort of, you know. Um, a lot of busy work and lots of uh, wading through documentation, but you, this really cuts through that that day-to-day -day work of, uh, you know, sort of pulling together documentation. Or even on the on the other side, if we're to have this uh, code, you can input the code and say, how does this code apply to uh, this particular security regime? So, fairly, um, uh, you know, useful stuff day-to-day. To help get through, and then of course you know you might have access to this uh, to Gemini as you might uh, copilot in uh, in in Google Docs or in sort of the, you know the, your work environment too. Okay, um, I'm going to move along, and I'm going to keep cycling through this here. So next up, um, let's look at let's look at. Google AI Studio Build. And so the next, so next step up as you want to start to get a little deeper into perhaps like um, either tuning a, a prompt or, or just working with uh, having a little, little bit more controls and still on the public side without you know, sort of getting into cloud yet when we'll get there. But we have Google AI Studio and Google AI Studio gives you a little bit more control over, um, over, over some technical, um, so you can choose the different models to, to test out, you can try, you know, adjust temperature, you can have it work entirely in JSON mode, and it gets you, I think the, the concept here is that it helps developers experiment a little bit more with the model before, um, you know, uh, perhaps setting up a lot of infrastructure to test it. And so, you know, you can test it right in here and you can get the code and, um, and, and run it in uh, Colab or a, a Python notebook pretty easily. And so, um, and then what you can also do in here too is you could really easily um, uh, write a quick little chatbot with examples or um, train with uh, data sets that you perhaps got, you know, through get from Kaggle. So, Really easy um, interface to use and experiment with uh, models and all. Um, and then, of course, you can actually use this without, you can use API key if you're building and use this uh, access to the resources you've created right in here. Pretty easy to develop with. Um, but I spend most of my time on, uh, on cloud. So I'm gonna walk you through uh, Vertex AI. Is anyone? I'm curious, anyone here building on Vertex AI? Okay, cool. Not many. Um, what I'd, uh, no, what I'm also doing, part of why I wanted to come, part of why I wanted to come today, though, too, was to 
yeah, to be here and introduce myself. Um, and, uh, you know, hope that, you know, happy to help. You know, so if, you know, if there's anything, any questions or you want, you know, um, I'm here. So, um, and I, you know, part of it is I'm planning to be a part of the, the community too. So, um, happy to dig into a little bit more about Google Cloud to, uh, if you need it. Okay, so what I want to walk through first, so Vertex AI is, um, is our, is, is our, our, our cloud AI platform. And, and so what's, for, what's more than Gemini, what's more than Google AI Studio that you saw, this is the platform that you could build on and uh, you know, in a way that's, yeah, it's not public. It's, um, you know, it's easy to build. We, I can, what I'm gonna show you is um, using multimodal sort of inferencing and, and uh, interaction to get information out of um, um, the, the LLM, but you'll see. And, but it's really about how you can then build these tools and extend them and, uh, and so on. Okay, so first, what I wanted to show was, well, uh, okay. So again, what I have everything I'm doing to, sorry, is all no code, everything you can do sort of in the, in the platform. Of course, there's, you know, it's all API based. Um, so you can, of course, build on it and extend it, but I just wanna show you some of the sort of capabilities here. So first, let's talk multimodal uh, and information extraction. What I'm gonna show here is um, just taking a flat image and asking questions. So the image looks like uh, a, uh, uh, a map of a hurricane movement uh, across Florida. Okay, so the question, and so um, asking what major event is represented in this image, what state did it have a severe impact and where did it make landfall, what was the highest wind speed, kilometers per hour measure and pressure in atmospheres, Answer all the questions and bullet points with just the answer. Uh, give me the data points of location. Hurricane, here, I'll let this go while I'm doing this. Uh, the hurricane width in kilometers, is, uh, assuming each circle is a new day, circle size is representative of the diameter of the hurricane. The center of the circle is a geographic point. Data uh, should be represented as a table, columns, uh, and then consolidate all is JSON. And so it's pretty amazing in that it picked out each day, uh, inferred the radius kilometers, like it's, it's in a map, so it could do the map, the points along the way, and then providing it as JSON. And so of course, you know, if you do want to use it as, um, you know, through the API, you can use it as JSON as, um, makes it useful. But it it's pretty accurately pulls out all the information um, and can be, uh, but, Pretty useful. And so the next, so the next example I'm going to show you is um, maybe a little bit more practical. Let's, so let's talk about. Uh, so I know, um, okay, cool. So next prompt here I'm going to show you a little bit more practical. Okay, so this um, talk about a form or just like document extraction. So this is a resume. The resume looks like what does the resume look like? Uh, I'm, it's obviously fake. Um, but uh, actually I had uh, AI generate it and it was, I'm just going to show you here. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, I just picked a cursive kind of font, but um, yeah, indeed. <laughs> it is, it is a gross font. Okay, but, okay, extract the name and phone number, respond in a table, the requirements are GCP Cloud SQL experience and Git and Python respond yes or no in a table. What is a candidate's work experience? Just title, code name. Company name, start date, duration and days, respond in a table, and then also respond with work experience, skills, education as JSON. Okay, so pretty cool. Like it's, it's able to extract all that information accurately, uh, which is good and handy, right? And so if you have a pile of documents to plow through, you can run this, you know, run it through to extract the information. And that's, that's part of you know, the promise. It's not gonna replace it, you know, the decisions made, but if it can make the work that much easier, then uh, that's, you know, that's the goal. Uh, and it, it can even, you know, it may do, I mean, obviously it can do simple calculations, but even if you, know, you had metrics in days, and if that's more useful, if that helps, then you can accomplish a lot of these um, uh, little mini tasks all in one. 
So pretty handy. Uh, it can be handy for sure. Um, you can imagine uh, the extensions into forms across the government and uh, you know all sorts of documents and unstructured documents. Um, lastly, one more quick case here. One more quick use case. Um, okay, so this was kind of neat. I like this one. I use this one for, um, so this was the outcome of a civic tech group. So our last civic tech meeting, we had a bunch of people get together and we broke into groups and we were um, brainstorming. And the outputs of these, you can't see them, but they're handwritten whiteboard notes. Uh, and so what I asked it to do is take all these whiteboard notes from each of the disparate groups and summarize, transcribe, and um, come back with some notes. And, you know, so not only was it able to transcribe, but I think, you know, but it is also able to fill in the gaps because, like, whiteboard notes are notoriously really messy and, uh, and not full thoughts, but it is able to come back with the notes and uh, information about the projects. And so, uh, if you've ever facilitated brainstorming before, like writing, you know, transcribing post-it notes is a real pain in the butt. And so this, you know, it just helps with that toil of, you know, just, uh, just this, it saves so much time just to be able to consolidate this and you can send get these notes back out to people immediately. So yeah, um, great, okay, cool. So the last thing I want to show you is this couple minutes. Okay, so I'm gonna skip the last thing uh, then and um, the only other concept I wanted to show and talk about is the concept of Agent Builder. Agent Builder is uh, our interface for building uh, chatbots and infobots, but it's, again, no code approach, and even our, um, what, I'll, what I'll do, no, I'll have to skip that, but um, you, you, you code it, you, you inform it just by way of a playbook, and so even the, the playbook is interpreted by large language model to build out the flow of the chatbot. Neat stuff. Okay, cool. Um, I'd like to in invite you all, so we have a, um, a immersive workshop on September 17th. Uh, you're all in, you're invited, so if you wanna come and join us, it's uh, hands-on in Google Cloud. We're gonna have a lot of um, uh, support folks there to help as you go, but you're, more, you're all welcome to come and join us, which is at the NAC. And you all got that? Okay. Yeah? What really is the difference between Vortex AI and Gemini? I don't really see the distinction. Sure, okay. Uh, and actually, before you answer that, I'm yeah. just gonna say we'll switch over. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna see all this. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you for getting into the questions. We'll switch over to some questions now, so. <laughs> yeah, that's I'll fine. let Brian answer right that, and then we'll move over to questions. Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, and if you're all wondering, you can reach me here. Okay, so, so the question was, what's the difference between Gemini and Vertex? So Gemini is the model. It's the name of the model, and Vertex is the name of the platform. And so Vertex includes access to models, but more than just Gemini, we have uh, integrated access to all of Hugging Face models and, and more um, custom-specific uh, models too, and uh, Vertex is the platform to access them, and it includes ML ops and um, governance and more. So that's the difference between two. Uh, right. Um, so you have the basic uh, credits when you sign up. Uh, we have, I mean, I'm not actually, I'd, I'd have to go back, I don't have these answers, but I know that we have the basic credits when you sign up and that gives you $300 or whatever access to it. Then there are startup credits, of course, too. Um, and community credits, I'm not actually sure. Uh, so I'd have to. Student credits? I don't, um, does anybody know if we have student credits? <laughs> not sure. Uh, I, Free collab, yeah, yeah, free collab, okay, good. I'd have to, you have to <laughs> reach out to me and ask. Okay. Uh, yeah.
So I, I think the, the, initial, the initial deployments have been um, highly, are, are like chatbots that are highly grounded in real documents. And so they're not really, in, you know, not intending to uh, create a new tuned language model, but and just removing the concept of hallucination, but with grounding. Uh, I think the initial ones are the internal chatbots. Those are the, the first ones, and and I know that uh, Government Canada has uh, an internal chatbot across the government. I think it's built on Azure. Um, but no, but nonetheless, they're using it though, right? And so those internal chatbots are the good first start. Um, uh, and I think you know different departments are looking at that first. And so anything that's sort of relatively RAG related is tends to be the first. Um, uh, but there's other use cases that you know they, they, that they're starting to look into, or at, even other software packages are integrating AI into. Like access to information tends to be one where it reduces a lot of toil. That's another good one, and but you know uh, they've been using machine learning too on uh, in meteorolo meteorology, and they've been used and in um, geospatial, I think, for a long time too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So Vertex AI and the cloud platform exist to be that um, secure area where you can deploy. Gemini is a closed, closed fixed model, like, and it is never, it's not tuned or does not use any information from your cloud, from your tenant at all to train Gemini. Gemini is trained from like, sort of external sources, and so while it's used for inferencing, it's not used to build at all. Would you say that's a differentiator between you guys and OpenAI? And OpenAI, yes. But, I mean, to be fair, like Microsoft, for example, uses closed, you know, closed models, frozen models of OpenAI on Azure. So, you, it, you know, in OpenAI using the public platform, I think if you're ready to go to production or deploy, you have to go onto the cloud platforms and you can use the frozen models but um, you have to deploy into production from like the cloud uh, platform you can't just I mean you should move away from open a like the the API is the public APIs hi hi so sorry could you just repeat I got most of that Yeah. 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 So, a um, there are de data residency laws and regulations that apply to data, and so right now a lot of data uh, training uh, and processing, you have to be wary about where you know the model will actually do the processing or where your data is going to reside. So that's important. Number two. Um, uh, there are so the government and treasury board they started to release guidelines on governance. It doesn't go down to the um, technical or code level, but it started to give some sort of guidance on how to manage it. Um, let's see. Uh, now, so you can like I mean it's you. I, I think there's also um, each department is going to have its own uh, policy around. And as they should, and evaluate what data is being used for training, what data is being used for, um, what data is, uh, yeah, being used for training, and whether or not they should be uh, sanitizing it before it goes into training. But you know, uh, it's gonna, you know, 
I, I think the government's a little bit behind right now in terms of providing that advice and guidance, and so they have to catch up with the policy because I think a lot of departments are really waiting for that guidance before they're taking any big steps forward. So I think that's part of the reason why it's slow is that they don't, there isn't a lot of concrete guidance on how to deploy within government. I haven't, I haven't worked with those, but I think that, I feel strongly that uh, it's a, they're a really good way to learn and start to build on AI. You know, we have no, part of what Google's done is try to build those no-code, you know, tools within Cloud Platform. So I feel strongly that's, and I'm bullish about, that's a great way to get started. Because it puts the, the power in the hands of uh, the problem owners, and you don't have to wait for developers or you don't have to necessarily always involve engineers and developers to move forward on a, a problem. It's a good way to experiment and try things out. I don't know those ones in particular, but I, I, I think they're a great way to get started, though. Great. Thank you. Lots of questions. Yeah. Yeah. Let's thank, uh, thank Brett for uh, a very interesting talk. And he was yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.